So um, on, on behalf of, of, of Mark Siegler and the McLean Center and, and myself and the Center for Health and Social Sciences, I want to uh, thank you for coming to this next lecture in our um, series on improving value in the U.S. healthcare system. Um, it's really a, a pleasure for me to introduce um, Eric. He's the senior um, vice president for policy and research at the Commonwealth Fund, which is a national philanthropy engaged in independent research on health and social policy. Um, Eric is a member of the Commonwealth Fund's executive management team. And he provides guidance to the organization on research topics and policy, health services, and health delivery. He helps um, do scientific review of the proposals. And as I just learned, to um, mentor so many of the staff there. Um, um, Eric um, trained in primary care, general internal medicine, and health services research, and he's become one of our country's leading health services researchers. Um, his work is in health policy, quality, measurement, quality improvement, health system innovation, primary care, um, health information technology, um, health insurance, access to care in vulnerable populations, almost sort of anything um, you could imagine. <laughs> Um, Eric um, was um, on the faculty at Harvard Medical School and the Harvard School of Public Health um, for, um, for, I guess, about 15 years. 15 years, right? Yeah. And where he taught health policy and also practiced primary care. And then after that, he went to the Rand um, Corporation. And then he was um, there, the distinguished chair in healthcare care quality. Um, Eric graduated from Columbia University. He holds a master's from um, Berkeley and MD from UCSF. He did his residency at Brigham and Women's. He had the dubious distinction of being my first resident when um, I was a, I was an intern. So he kept me from killing people during um, that first month, week or two. So thank you for doing that. Um, um, Eric's talk today is entitled "The Mismeasure of Healthcare: Can Measurement Improvement and Cost Reduction Be um, Reunited?" So Eric, welcome. Great. And uh, great to see you. And thank, again, you. thank you. Likewise. Thank you, David. That's a really incredibly kind introduction. And uh, I, uh, there's something about uh, having seen uh, people in scrubs uh, that, that <laughs> persists for a lifetime. So it really is a pleasure to, to be here to talk with you today about this topic. Uh, I'm going to, this is a small group, so I hope people will actually uh, interrupt and ask questions as, uh, as I go through this uh, talk. Uh, it's really uh, something I've been um, thinking about for a while and, and I'm really still developing ideas. So your feedback reactions would be incredibly uh, helpful to me. Uh, as David mentioned, I have had a research career going back to the mid-1990s uh, when uh, the uh, notion of quality measurement was just getting off the ground and I'll say more about that in a minute. Uh, but we've actually come quite a long way in the last 20 years uh, since those first efforts. Uh, to measure quality. And um, I and I think others are beginning to express uh, questions about whether we're at an inflection point and it may be time to reevaluate how we've developed our quality measurement programs, public reporting programs, and payment reform programs or payment uh, models, and really think hard about what the right pathway is going forward. So that's what I'm going to try to touch on today in a very broad way. If people at all, if there are any acronyms or any concepts or organizations here that you don't recognize, uh, please just put up your hand and, and ask the question. I'll try to make this uh, as uh, user friendly as I can. So, um, about 400 years ago, uh, Galileo uh, took uh, what is probably equivalent of what you could buy in a standard hardware store uh, in terms of magnification. A pair of binoculars, you could take this and do this experiment. And he developed a telescope, which was a wooden tube with lenses at both ends, this pictured there, and began to observe uh, the planet Jupiter uh, and noticed that there were these little, four little stars uh, around Jupiter, and they were exhibiting odd motions compared to what would have been predicted at the time. At the time, the belief was that all of the heavenly bodies rotated around the Earth. And Galileo saw that these, um, uh, night after night, sort of observing this, that these little stars around Jupiter were actually moving in a particular way. And he literally, this is the text, or not the literal text, but a translation of his observations night after night as to where these, uh, these uh, stars were. And uh, over time, he came up with the idea that, in fact, the only thing that would explain these movements was that these are 
moons. He didn't know they were moons, but they were circula circling Jupiter and not, not the Earth. And most of you probably know that for that scientific insight, uh, he's very memorable, and he was almost burnt at the stake uh, because this was very controversial in his time. He was showing you through a very simple measurement instrument uh, a, a, a truth, an underlying truth that was not understood at the time. So um, about 300 years later, uh, Percival Lowell, uh, had a, uh, who has a very famous uh, uh, observatory named for him, uh, had developed a much more sophisticated uh, telescope and was observing Mars and noticed that there were patterns of change on the surface of Mars uh, through his telescope. And um, as he sort of thought through what might be happening, he came to the conclusion that Martians had built an extensive canal system and that this was part of a big agricultural product project and they were, uh, uh, the, the seasonal changes actually on the Martian planet were signs of alien life cultivating uh, food or something else on the planet Mars. Uh, so kind of an interesting uh, sort of mashup to think about Galileo with a very simple instrument observing night after night coming to a conclusion that has been verified. And Lowell, who this was actually quite uh, newsworthy at the time, uh, announcing final proof that the planet Mars is inhabited. I can't help but notice that it was from Chicago. And it was published in a Chicago, uh, out of a Chicago newspaper. And uh, so, uh, uh, so th this was uh, a, a sort of, I think, a warning sign to anyone who wants to use measurement uh, to detect uh, changes about the uh, potential uh, mishaps that can occur around inference. So with that kind of metaphor in mind, uh, I'd like to today to walk through, and, and actually, do we have till 1 o'clock? Uh, usually we run till 1. A little, yeah. Okay, yeah. great. I'll try to keep it within that bound, and I'd love to uh, yeah. have some Q&A. So I uh, want to walk through. Okay. Uh, the U.S. Healthcare Challenge, don't tempt me. <laughs> uh, the U.S. Healthcare Challenge and Evolution of Performance Measurement. I'm going to do this fairly quickly. Um, uh, and, but again, interrupt if, it, if it's uh, too quick. And then I want to talk a bit about some of the limits of the current measurement efforts that are out there. This hopefully will introduce you to some of those. And then, um, and then I'll, I'll uh, finish with some uh, thoughts about resetting the measurement agenda as uh, we go forward. So this is a uh, performance report that uh, the Commonwealth Fund has actually been generating for 20 years now. Uh, and when I came to the fund four years ago, uh, we, we did a sort of top to bottom review of the methodology and made some modifications to the methods. Uh, but essentially the, what this represents is a summary graphic of uh, 72 uh, quality indicators in various domains, access, uh, process of care, uh, uh, outcome, some, out some outcomes and uh, administrative uh, burden measures. And uh, we organized those and, and selected those uh, with the help of expert panels. And then this, this, form, this uh, we can actually, there's a report and a summary of the findings of this. Uh, and the results here are pretty consistent with what we've observed over time, which is that the US, uh, among the 11 high-income countries represented here, is the lowest, of the lowest performer, much of that having to do with access and inequalities in care, some with health outcomes as well. And um, the top performing countries are the UK, Australia, and the Netherlands. It's not shown here, but if you look sort of at the statistics of this, uh, there are really three groups of countries. There's Canada, France, and the US. There are the UK, Australia, and Netherlands, and then the middle countries. And um, uh, the, 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 this is really just to make the point, which has been made by the IOM and others, that the quality of care in the U.S. hasn't been optimal uh, and that uh, that continues to be the case here, at, at least in comparison to other international countries. And then we also make the point in other materials in, in, in this report as well that healthcare spending as a percent of GDP has been growing faster in the U.S. than in other countries. I don't think that's uh, news to anyone here. That's been a trend since uh, at least 1980. Uh, and it has continued uh, with sort of fits and starts as the economic conditions have changed in, in, in all of the countries, really. Uh, but we're, we're an outlier on spending and, a, and an outlier on quality. And then uh, another observation, just to throw into the mix, because it may come up later, uh, 
is uh, this paper from uh, Bob Kocher uh, about labor productivity in healthcare compared to other sectors. And the notion is uh, that um, for healthcare compared to other sectors of the U.S. economy uh, over this 20 year period, 1990 to 2010, um, um, employment growth has been robust in healthcare, but labor productivity growth has been negative, uh, at least by this measure. And um, what that means is that um, the labor productivity is lagging the other sectors. And that actually is potentially unsustainable in an economy uh, just because uh, uh, you know, more labor is not necessarily the best solution uh, to uh, problems of uh, healthcare delivery. Can I just ask you a question? Yeah, please. How do, they, how do they measure labor productivity in this context? Uh, I'd have to refer you back to the yeah. paper for the exact details. Yeah, I just, I just wonder because like, wages are very complicated to think about in yeah. this context. And, and then sort of objective measures of productivity are also um, um, really hard to figure out and very complicated teams and other things. Yeah. No, absolutely right. And, and you know, this, there are different ways of approaching this sort of problem, which could yeah. give different results potentially. Yeah. I think Kate Baker, has, who's here at the Harris School, has made the point that um, uh, she makes the point that this might not be a good jobs program to sort of produce health care, but, but, uh, and that there could be inefficiencies. Another question? How does health are measured compared to other countries? On the yeah, I'm sorry I don't have that because that's an obvious question kind of in this context that was presented, but I don't, uh, I don't think it's that different, but health care is also a really different good, and it's a luxury good. The other countries tend to have con uh, spending constraints through global budgets, capitated budgets, and so in the U.S. we tend to have a more open-ended approach, which means that um, you know, our labor productivity could be quite, uh, could be pretty much the same as what they're producing. Yeah, so there's, a, there's an economics literature, and this goes back to William Baumol. Mm. Um, this was originally called Baumol's Cost Disease, and it was supposed to apply to service sectors in general. So um, the, he, did, he looked at education. So education's another sector that mm. tends to be more labor intensive. He also looked at things like um, um, TV repairmen, uh -huh. you know, which basically disappeared. Right, as a like no one repairs things like that anymore. Yeah. But but that literature is not without its critics. You know, both in terms of whether the underlying fact is true, yeah, like as well as the measurement issues that are that are part of it. Yeah. And um, you know, like you think, okay, healthcare is fundamentally labor intensive, but then you realize, you know, you can substitute, you know, clever sanitary products for um, nursing support. Yeah. You know, um, um, you can you can reformulate drugs to be given, you know, orally rather than IV. Um, right. Know, long acting preparations rather than short. So there's actually. So there are. I think the point of this sort of slide, and again, I'll come back to it later in the talk, is the notion that maybe we haven't imagined all of the potential yeah, efficiencies that, that, sure. that could be achieved in healthcare, and uh, and so we'll come back to that. Uh, so now I want to take the little short history of performance measurement and, and capture a few uh, notions that I, uh, I find sometimes people weren't aware of. Uh, and the first is that the, the origins of the quality measurement movement in the U.S. really coincided with the uh, HMO movement of the 1990s. Uh, there was a significant concern of going to a risk-based, capitation-based payment uh, was going to um, lead to stinting on care, to, to rationing of care, and that some mechanism was necessary to try to s notice whether that was happening, to detect that. And so uh, the National Committee for Quality Assurance, which I worked at briefly for a year in uh, the 1990s, uh, was just getting off the ground at that point. I think there were three measures or seven measures when I joined. Uh, there are now dozens of measures, if not more. Uh, but the, um, the central idea was that this would be a public reporting kind of mechanism to, as a check on HMOs and their growth. And there was a similar conversation earlier when the DRG payment system came to hospitals back in the uh, 70s and 80s that uh, led to the development of quality measures of hospital care for the same, under the same concern that DRGs would lead to um, quicker and sicker discharges. But, but just, you know, one of the interesting parts of this history, which I think is really important, is that the types of measures that were developed, particularly by NCQA, were things like preventive care and things like that. Yeah. You know, and, 
And if you think about the underlying economics of capitation, the underlying economics of capitation is actually to spend more money on healthy people. Because they're the people who you want in your plan. What you don't want are the people who are really sick. Yeah. Right? And so like, yeah, you know, measure me on mammograms and pap smears and you know how much patients like coming to my social events. Um, but don't measure me on whether, you know, I've got high 30 day readmission rates or, you know, um, yeah. really good care for super complex patients. It's a so, <coughs> so this part of the history, I think, also kind of distorted the industry. Yeah, I, you know, it's a very interesting point and, and really had to do with the uh, availability of data at the time. I mean, this is one example of the street lamp problem. But I also think you're right that there was a, a sort of influence. There was a logic model for what HMOs would do. They would prevent illness. And so we wanted to measure the salutary prevention strategy and know, and know that that was actually happening. Uh, but, but to get at the, the issue that I first mentioned about, well, the, you know, bringing people in and then restricting their access to specialty services, having them die earlier, uh, restricting access to hospitals, emergency rooms. That really wasn't captured well here. It was captured through utilization measures that um, actually have just been retired uh, recently at NCQA. Uh, uh, but that raises that question of like, what's the proper um, uh, set of domains to evaluate these sorts of organizations? Um, there was a kind of an interesting pivot, I think, after that point um, that led, I believe, mostly by Don Berwick, but a committee that he had put together and appears in the journal Medical Care around performance measurement and reporting, not as a sort of regulatory check on HMOs, but as an improvement motivator. And so uh, they posited that there were sort of two pathways for this motivation. The first was the market transparency and consumer, consumer choice argument that consumers uh, would actually use this information uh, from performance measure and reporting to actually select uh, providers. And actually, that was embedded in the NCQA thing, too, that people would actually have that information so as they were choosing their health plans at uh, open enrollment. And that, that, that volume demand market mechanism would actually motivate competition among provider groups. And then they, um, uh, Don being Don, they, they actually uh, thought there was a really uh, also critical role for organization and a professional improvement, and that these measures would motivate providers, the managers through reputation and brand, and providers too. We want to make sure we're at the top of the quality uh, uh, mountain. And that they would also drive intrinsic motivation. If people saw that they were underperforming, they would be motivated intrinsically to want to to fix the problem. And so I think that that notion of this as a motivating path was important. Then a, f a sort of different thing happened in around two th that, that same time that they were positing that mechanism, which was that financial incentives could be used to drive this more quickly and, and get the attention of providers. And that's when a pay for performance, the early 2000s when pay for performance programs were introduced in the hospital setting, this is sort of a CMS uh, evaluation uh, over 2003 to 2005, looking at hospitals with pay for performance alone, uh, pay for performance plus public reporting versus hospitals that were just doing public reporting. And uh, for three conditions, myocardial infarction, heart failure, pneumonia, and a composite, the hospitals that were on the pay for performance uh, group, uh, in addition to public reporting, we're actually showing some difference in trend, steeper trend, actually improving at a faster rate over this period of time. And this paper, which published in 2007, I think kind of opened the floodgates for the policymakers. And there were others uh, looking at uh, physician group uh, pay for performance. And uh, we, uh, the, 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 it, it actually got formalized to some extent in 2010 when the ACA was passed that we actually could uh, use a variety of measures to guide pay for performance incentives and then signal the market and literally pay people bonuses and penalties uh, depending on their uh, performance on this. And the payments would be for hospitals. This is the hospital value-based purchasing uh, notion. Uh, and uh, you'll see this is the 2017 version of the, of the measure set. Uh, you can see the relative allocation, the weights given to each of the domains in the payment formula. And um, 
an interesting thing sort of creeps in here around efficiency and cost reduction as one of the key domains of performance measurement. So we're not only going to reward for quality, we're also going to reward or, or penalize based on uh, efficiency and cost reduction uh, goals that will be embedded. Isn't, there, doesn't <coughs> sort of, isn't the Lindenauer paper kind of an exception in this literature? I mean, I, I'm thinking this review Meredith Rosenthal did a couple of years ago looking yeah. at paper performance. Doesn't she kind of mostly decide it really doesn't work? Yeah, we're, we're sort of heading in that direction. Uh, I just right. wanted to sort of set the stage. Uh, I mean, maybe this is all as familiar to everyone in the room. Uh, that this was going on. Uh, but um, the other thing that <coughs> sort of arises in this context, and, and it'll arise in, in another context, so I'll get to that, um, is uh, the notion of uh, where the variability sits in these sorts of, mul in these complex schemes. Um, how much variation there is among organizations can differ a lot between these different categories of performance. And that actually makes a big difference in terms of what the composite sort of outcome looks like <clears throat> for hospitals. And we're going we're gonna to come back to that. Another uh, sort of ACA um, uh, innovation, I guess, was the ho hospital readmissions reduction uh, program. And uh, the HRRP <coughs> uh, was, um, uh, people had been measuring readmissions rates at CMS, I think, since the 1990s. And they knew there was a lot of variation among hospitals in readmission rates. There were still a lot of questions about what explained those variations. Uh, but um, program officials uh, with expert input felt comfortable going forward with an actual penalty program and a, a special quality improvement program to reduce readmissions. And you know, there's nothing great. Readmissions are an, are, can be an issue, uh, but there was no attempt in this scheme to sort of differentiate appropriate from inappropriate readmissions, because that's actually a complicated thing to try to do. Uh, but they did risk adjust uh, the readmissions, and that's going to turn out to be an important point later. Uh, but you can see here, this is actually claimed as one of the sort of sentinel successes of the uh, ACA uh, hospital uh, value-based payment uh, initiative overall, uh, that readmissions dropped a lot between 2010 and, and October uh, 2012. Uh, and then <coughs> Uh, one thing to point out here is that the penalty started in 2012. So a lot of the change actually occurred before 2012, before there were any penalties. You could say, well, is that a sentinel effect? Are they anticipating that uh, they're going to get penalized and so they make changes? Uh, or is there something else going on? And, uh, and then after that, once the penalties are in place for both targeted conditions, that's the upper one, and for non-targeted conditions with readmissions, uh, and the targeted are heart failure, pneumonia, uh, AMI, uh, and some others. Uh, the non-targeted conditions, uh, um, you can see the slopes are actually fairly flat, even though there are penalties in place. Um, so the, the, um, the logic of all of that was extended in 2015 when the macro was passed as a payment reform for physicians. It did a, a great service by eliminating the SGR, the Sustainable Growth Rate Formula, which had been the prevailing way of setting pay physician payment, but was kind of unworkable as a policy, because year after year, Congress would override it, and physicians would get a little bit of an increase, but no one was really sure that they were going to get the increase. And um, this did away with that, which was a, a, certainly a benefit. And it introduced uh, something that looks relatively similar to the hospital value-based payment program, which was a notion of categories of performance measures uh, which would then be uh, feed into a payment update for on a fee-for-service basis. So <clears throat> you get paid a higher rate in the future years if you performed well in prior years. And uh, the categories were quality, resource use, again coming in here, efficient use of resources as an idea, advancing care information, which is a fancy term for uh, making better use of electronic health records, um, and then clinical practice improvement. Uh, this is sort of a nod to the idea that um, clinicians should be rewarded for participating in improvement activities in their offices and, and professions. And then you can see the relative allocations change over, are planned to change over time. The 2019 allocation has 50% on quality, 10% uh, on resource use. By 2021, that shifts to 30% and 30% uh, sort of quality and resource use on an even footing with the balance going to the other two. 
So let me ask if there are any questions before we move to limits. These programs are familiar to folks. Okay, and I've gone very quickly through them. If there's more detail, obviously. Uh, so let's talk about what some of the limits have been of current measurement approaches. So the, on the theory of consumers, uh, well, let, let me sort of give a summary slide and then I'll walk through them. Uh, they should, in homage to uh, Sergio Leone, it should say the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, but it's um, mostly the bad and the ugly. Uh, and so uh, I've done a little violence to Sergio Leone, but I think it'll become more apparent why. Uh, so the first point is that um, it has been extremely hard to get consumers engaged in using quality information from these formal reporting systems. Partly because people don't trust government, that's a sort of con recurring theme uh, the, as a source of this information. Uh, but there are other factors as well. Uh, there's been some speculation in recent literature that that might be changing, but um, I'm, I'm not persuaded yet. Second is that there's limited evidence from stu many studies now that have been done that there's really improvements in population health as a result of the, these programs, and I'll through a few examples of that. Um, I think professionals have been <clears throat> rightfully skeptical of, of the value of these results. Um, they've seen uh, issues, technical issues that sort of come up and come into play around risks, sampling, uh, different populations cared for by different types of providers, uh, coding issues around changes being more driven by coding than by actually care delivery changing. Um, and then patient preferences, which has always been a concern about to what extent do any of these measures, which are mostly based on adherence to guidelines, reflecting the complexity of patients with multiple comorbidities, patients who may prefer not to get care. Uh, we were doing a study of uh, flu vaccination, for example, and you, vaccination is a classic. You know, people might have different preferences depending on whether it's a mandatory or non-mandatory, but for non-mandatory vac vaccinations like flu vaccination, Patient preference could even vary from place to place. Uh, and we found out there wasn't much of an issue there, but that's, that's a, a, just one example of the concern. And <clears throat> the other thing is that there has been relatively limited utility in the daily work of clinicians. It's been a really hard sell to bring these measures to groups of clinicians and engage. I mean, you can engage them. Um, the changes are possible. I've seen this in my own primary care practice over time. But it's, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of benefit based on these measures. Sometimes ad adaptations of these measures in specific settings have, have driven quality improvement programs. But outside of a very deliberate quality improvement project, uh, just getting this information uh, has, um, to, most daily, to most clinicians, has, has been not much return on an investment that has included having to code and having to enter data in EHRs to do this. So that's to the issue of burden. Uh, there have been redundant and misaligned measures uh, in the measurement sets. Uh, there's been confusion around some of that and the data collection and reporting requirements that I've already mentioned. Can I, can I ask a question? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I have my own answer, which maybe I'll share and then you can comment on the answers <laughs> of the questions. With all these negatives, why has this happened? So uh, that's a great question, actually. Okay, I, 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 I'll, let me share my thought. <laughs> Uh, I'm happy to share a thought too. But, okay. I was just going to say. I, this is what it was like on rounds every morning. Well, I mean, I, I guess part of what annoys me about this is that there's a whole industry that pushes this. So that's one. Okay. And, and actually, that's a well known policy, public policy issue that once you create a system, it, ta it creates its own kind of set of demands and lobbyists and, and inertia around change. So I, I totally agree. This industry has grown up to respond to these needs coming from CMS and from uh, health plans. There's a whole vendor industry around performance measurement, well, for example, for just one example. And a not-for-profit industry that, yeah. you know, hopefully believes it's doing the right thing, but it's also yeah. a job. The other, the other answer to your question, for me at least, is, uh, and I'd welcome other thoughts on this, is that um, if you look at performance measurement in many contexts, <coughs> It's a way of regulators saying that they're regulating without admitting to, to being regulators. And that in the current, um, as, as things have evolved uh, in our uh, society,
Um, this gives a credibility to the public policy makers, the, the people who are setting the agenda, that they're actually dealing with a problem without them having to be responsible for what they're intervening on or what the, the results are. So they can say, well, we've created this for consumers, we've created it for hospitals to improve. Uh, they take the heat, no question about that. But from a political standpoint, when they're questioned, they can say, well, we've, we've, you know, we've gone along, we've created these programs. And that has value, and I don't mean in the, the big P political sense, but in the agency political sense or the regulator, regulatory uh, political sense. That has value because it's action that <clears throat> actually doesn't, it doesn't necessarily affect the stakeholders as directly. So their decisions are not having a direct effect, like we're cutting your budget, this is a global budget uh, state, and we will manage your budget for, for, for the hospital. Thank you very much. Instead, it's, okay, we'll have these performance measures, we'll look for outliers, and we'll try to drive the mean. But we're not actually directly impacting that. So. And there's also a, a professional a resistance on anybody's part to being measured. So there's no yeah. incentive to make these <laughs> to make these programs work. There's probably incentives <coughs> to not work. In, yeah. In, in, in insidious kinds of ways too. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's certainly been pushback on these on these measurement programs, and a lot of it from the professional community at a many levels. Um, I think the, um, the 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 sort of zeitgeist of the since the 1980s at least around consumers and markets is an ongoing sort of ideological or philosophical orientation that, that probably isn't going to go anytime soon, but it's part of what I think I'm challenging here. Yeah? How active are the professional societies with this? Because what I've been told and observed is that if you're not at the table, the rules are going to be written for you. Yeah. And if you, at least if you have one physician or one surgeon right there at one of these meetings. Yeah. And maybe you're the person that does that. So I, I have, have played that role in many, in many instances. So, so it's an interesting thing to reflect on because it varies tremendously. I would say of the groups that I've worked with, and actually I should disclose I've been co-chair of NCQA's Committee on Performance Measurement, the idea of bringing multiple stakeholders to the table and really working hard to uh, make sure the measures will be informative uh, has been a very productive approach. I've seen other organizations that have tipped the balance one way, you know, too much one way or the other, and sometimes it can depend even on just who's the voice in the room. Uh, and that dynamic has a lot of influence as well. But AMA, for example, had a physician consortium for performance improvement that was advancing measures to CMS and NQ and National Quality Forum, which is another measure endorsement organization. The, a lot of those measures were rejected uh, because their physicians didn't invite other stakeholders into the review process. And there was questions among the health plan leaders or the regulators or the consumers about whether those measures really represented quality from the standpoint that they cared about. So it's quite, I mean, it's a complicated answer to your question, but it makes a big difference for physicians to be involved. And, and if people haven't seen it, there's a paper um, uh, calling for a timeout on performance measurement. Eve Kerr, I think, is the first author. And uh, the ACP committee, which I had chaired before Eve came to it, um, did a review of the validity of the performance indicators in a uh, sample of performance indicators uh, from the National Quality Measures Clearinghouse. And they determined that about a third of them kind of met validity criteria uh, uh, according to this review panel. It's actually a nice publication to look at because uh, the uh, types of measures and the validity problems are well outlined in the appendices. Uh, so, uh, so there is a, a dialogue on this uh, and some data actually. Uh, the reason they called for a timeout is that if two-thirds of these are not producing meaningful information, why are we continuing to spend $15 billion a year just to collect measures in the ambulatory setting, if you, if you believe that estimate? Yeah. I'm often puzzled by about this performance. Doctors want to have the best performance any moment. They are like a violinist, they don't want to play a wrong note. Mm -hmm. They are like an ice skater, they don't want it to fall or break. So, unless a person is ill mentally, a doctor, he always wants to do his best. If the performance is not good, because there are all other around it. Mm -hmm. If I operate on a person, and I am forced to send that patient home, in two days rather than keeping. 
is more likely to come back because of a suture infection, because of yeah. water leaking, or because if that person economically is not doing well, that person at home does not follow my rule. So the performance is always being, you know, as if we develop performance in ballerinos or performance in ice yeah. skating. We always wanted to do good, and I, yeah. I'm always puzzled by this improved performance. What do you mean? What do you do? Yeah, so that's a great question, and, and it gets to there being multiple different perspectives on per thinking about performance. There, the physician's perspective that you just outlined, and, and the performance athletes, high-performing musicians. I mean, there's a there's a coaching cycle, and a continuous improvement cycle there. Um, in this context, people are often thinking about what's happening to the health of the population. And um, sometimes the, there's a mistaken attribution, uh, and we're actually going to touch on this, that the attribution is what's the problem. So um, the, a hospital may be taking care of a sicker group of patients on average or a, 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 in a poorer community with fewer social uh, and economic resources. Does that hospital, can that hospital perform at the same level as another hospital, will the outcomes of those patients look the same? Probably not. And I'm, I'm going to come back to that because I think that's an important point that you've raised. And it, and it gets also, I think, to the uh, skepticism of professionals about the results because professionals, in my own experience, they're, uh, sometimes I felt like I lived in two different worlds. I'd be talking about performance at a committee meeting in Washington, D.C., and then I was in clinic seeing patients. And I want to try to address that. Uh, I think I've covered this already, but for those who want sort of detailed reports on why consumers don't use performance information, uh, there, these two reports, one from RAND by Tom Concanon and one uh, that New York State just did a, a review on. Uh, there's just a con an endless hunger to actually try to get this right through reformatting and, and uh, different digital distribution approaches. And it just hasn't been that easy to uh, engage consumers. And consumers are typically disappointed when they see the measures that are available. The other problem is that we have measures that, um, <clears throat> I call them street lamp measures because the data are available and it sounds like a good idea to do the th whatever the uh, process is, the action is. Uh, and so it gets collected. And here is uh, adult BMI assessment uh, in health plans reported by NCQA. And it's broken out by different types of uh, payers. I think commercial PPO is the orange one on the bottom. But what's, uh, what I wanted to point out is that there's been a dramatic increase in the documentation of adult BMI. Um, there are now electronic scales that automatically record this. If you put someone on the scale, it probably goes into the record. And, uh, but health plans actually spend money making sure they've collected these data on their, um, on their members. Uh, which is another complex issue about the relationship between the plans and the and the data, the data the plans hold, the data the providers hold. But what's been happening to obesity during this relatively similar time frame? It's continuing to go up. So we have now a situation where the process measure, which is kind of a weak process measure as you think about it, documenting a BMI. What is that? Does that really change things? Um, and the answer is no. Uh, we, we don't have uh, weight reductions, which is actually the health outcome we care about. The other um, challenge is in this area is that the, what are called high stakes measures, measures where uh, at least some committee of people believes that they're precise and reliable enough to be the basis for payment, uh, to drive payment changes. Um, a lot of those measures have been around for a while. And this GAO report looked at several of them. And what you see here is, uh, you can't see the individual um, items, but they're all sort of process measures in hospital value-based purchasing. Measured in hospitals while the hospitals were just doing reporting. And then when the incentive started in 2013, more or less. And uh, that shaded area, you can see by the time they actually start the program, most of the hospitals, the hospital performance is topped out. Uh, you know, can you get from 95% to 100%? Maybe. But what uh, then happens is you've introduced a financial incentive in a situation where there's a very narrow band of performance at a very high end of the, of the, of the group. And the curve is going gonna, is gonna to be a killer. Uh, 
there's going to be very little variation among those hospitals on those measures. And so differences of 92 versus 94 percent will start to drive the payment uh, uh, for return to hospitals. So this is also a perennial problem. As soon as you ask people to measure something, they start to improve it. We don't know whether they're actually improving the care delivered. They're definitely improving the documentation and they top out. Uh, this study uh, looked at uh, process outcome, uh, uh, an outcome for the, uh, uh, the, the hospital quality uh, uh, reporting program and uh, looked, in, this is interesting, they had a group that had started before another group of hospitals came on board and so the early adopters and the late adopters were compared. And you would think that over time um, hospitals would sort of learn and um, the hospitals that were late adopters uh, might take uh, longer to sort of learn and, and do all the process changes that are necessary to, to uh, change improvement. But what really happens is uh, the early adopters kind of get up there and the late adopters come along and they get up there too. And uh, throughout this whole time, hospital mortality is declining. You can see the annual variations with the seasons. Um, and it kind of flattens out uh, by the time the uh, hospital value-based purchasing program is in place. So what this says, uh, what this said to the investigators is that these process changes don't seem to be, uh, there's not a learning curve that we can sort of detect here. There's a learning curve in general, but it doesn't seem to be different for more experienced hospitals versus less experienced hospitals. And that's a strange finding that sh there should be a difference uh, if, if what's really happening here is that processes are changing. Um, now I want to talk about the readmissions penalties and some of the evidence that has emerged. And I'm, I'm again going to go fairly briefly over this. The um, first uh, sort of warning sign was this readmissions reduction was weakly correlated with mortality reductions uh, published in 2017. Um, and they even found that in the heart failure group, uh, mortality, risk adjusted mortality among heart failure patients increased after the uh, readmissions reduction program was implemented. So the concern is sicker patients being sent home, they destabilize, no one wants to readmit them, so they put them in OBS or they do something else. And you can imagine a fragile heart failure patient might not be able to tolerate that, uh, that uh, change. So, uh, and that was out to one year, which was also uh, concerning. Is this over time degrading the care of this group of patients? The other observation just recently published is, and this has been seen in other settings, and we had actually simulated this effect in, in one of our early studies of primary care, is that the penalties disproportionately fall on the hospitals with less resources who are taking care of, of a more socioeconomically disadvantaged population. Uh, and that actually is not probably what we want to be doing. I mean, if you're taking care of a disadvantaged population, you need more resources to do that effectively, not less. And so there's this worry that the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, the hospitals taking care of the richer patients are getting rewards, and the others are getting penalized. And they quantify it. Um, these are, it's not a huge amount of money, but over time it could become quite a, a threat to the bottom line of safety net hospitals. So it's, at cross purposes with what we're trying to do clinically. The last uh, is a, also a recent publication that uh, called into question whether the signal success of the ACA on hospital readmissions reduction was actually a success at all. And uh, that I showed you this already. Um, another thing happened in 2010 and nobody kind of noticed it, or at least they didn't until this uh, study was uh, published in health affairs. Uh, but another study had come out last year su suggesting it too. And in this year, um, CMS changed the electronic reporting requirement for the technical uh, format for reporting from hospitals. They went from 10 diagnosis codes to 25. And what happens when you do that is hospitals knowing that risk uh, equals money and also just documenting. It's, you know, if you can sort of reflect all of the complexity of, of hospitalized patients, that's probably a good thing. Uh, they started using more diagnosis codes, but they didn't adjust the model for that. And so these reductions happening for both non-targeted and targeted conditions during this period, 
uh, the authors estimate about at least half of them are due to that coding change. Uh, that, in fact, when you look at non-targeted conditions in targeted hospitals and targeted conditions in non-participating uh, hospitals, uh, you can see that much of the effect is this technical change in the way the data are collected has really very little or nothing to do with, uh, uh, with the uh, incentive program. Of course, it also precedes the actual penalties. And then when you look at the penalty phase, not much change. Well, they've probably maxed out on the coding change, so that's not going to gain anything additional. And um, so what is this program really doing? It looks like this may have been a documentation uh, change that accounts for a, what's called a success in, in the use of financial incentives. Um, I'm going to skip over this, uh, but people have asked whether measurement and incentives work better in ambulatory care settings. And this is a randomized controlled trial. I won't, uh, I'll just tell you that they found that there were uh, better uh, in, uh, improvements in primary care practices where there were financial incentives tied to achieving preventive services um, so that it can work. Uh, but um, this uh, review by Mendelssohn of the literature, all the literature that date on ambulatory uh, pay for performance suggests that there's little or no evidence that it actually uh, results in change. The evidence is weak. Uh, a lot of it comes from England where they had the, the biggest incentive program and the effects have been inconsistent. If I haven't put the nail in the coffin yet, this is what happened in England uh, when uh, the quality um, uh, measurement program retired uh, measures. They actually didn't retire the measures, they just took away the financial incentives. Uh, this is clinical process indicators where the incentives were removed. And these are things like uh, glycohemoglobin down here, uh, cholesterol testing, diabetes, retinopathy screening. And you can see there's a clear decrement uh, after the financial uh, incentive is removed. So it looks like there's less testing happening uh, after the incentive removed. And they're, they're measuring, they're still measuring in the background, which is very clever uh, that they're able to do this. Um, here is blood pressure documented in uh, patients with serious mental illness and alcohol consumption documented in patients with serious mental illness. Incentive is still maintained, no change. This uh, are intermediate outcome measures where they remove the incentives. And uh, uh, cholesterol control, you know, the first two lines up here, there's a bit of a decrement again. Um, this one is the documentation uh, that patients with epilepsy are seizure free. Goes from 60% down to like 10% overnight, stays down. So a documentation indicator where the clinicians just said, oh great, I don't get paid for this anymore. I'm not gonna document it. Or maybe they're not even asking a question, we don't know. Uh, same thing, um, but it seems unlikely. Uh, blood pressure control, cholesterol control, with the incentives maintained, um, no change. So there are a couple of ways to interpret this. One is um, the clinicians kind of get sloppy and don't do things they should be doing. Uh, the other way to interpret it is that they were testing and documenting for patients who maybe weren't going to benefit that much. The clinical judgment kind of might be playing a role here that the, the measure definitions might not be specifying a population uh, that, that where there's discretion uh, as to whether a cholesterol test is the most intelligent thing to do in this patient with advanced multi-comorbidity or, or some other contraindication. Uh, so um, I think the jury's still out, but what this tells me is that there's a, a tremendous sensitivity of these measures to the financial incentives, and we can't rule out the possibility that people are gaming them, just documenting things, yeah. clicking boxes. I mean, and the other thing, of course, the other weakness, right, is that whatever time it took to do this presumably was taken from some other million set of things, none of which we measured. Yeah, so that's my other biggest concern here is the sort of uh, the, the driving to performance, t teaching to the test sort of reaction uh, or, or uh, responding to the test and then sort of putting other things off to the side. And so my, my question is whether value-based purchasing is to that point diverting healthcare from actually working on quality and affordability. Uh, and I always liked uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's uh, 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 description at the depth of the depression. It's common sense to take a method and try it. If it fails, admit it uh, and, and, and try another. But above all, try something. Uh, 
And uh, here's where I think we really, uh, we're sort of locked into a performance measurement scheme right now that is kind of running um, uh, ahead, but it's unclear whether it will um, get us where we want to go. And it's also unclear whether people are going to be willing to retire it for the reasons we discussed earlier. Uh, there are a number of diagnoses one could sort of apply to this problem of, um, of the lack of evidence now. Um, and I won't go through these in detail, but there are a set of hypotheses one could have about weakness of incentives, for example. Some people say we should just be putting more in financial incentives in place. It's just too weak. It's not a strong signal. Um, uh, you can uh, make a lot of uh, stories around inability of professionals to adapt and change for reasons that are really outside the control of professionals, the way payments work, the way the systems organize. Um, and there's always this inherent uncertainty lurking in the background. So let me give you a few thoughts on, um, on uh, measurement reset. One theme that's uh, popular right now is, uh, well, we just need to shift the focus to measuring health outcomes, and then everything will work out OK. We're, we're too sort of buried in process measures at this point. Um, the second is the, a paper that we uh, published on reimagining performance measurement in a different way. Uh, I think there's probably a need to invest in research and development on novel uses of emerging data sources. We actually are now in a, in a, in a, in a, a data environment that's changing rapidly and opening up new opportunities, but there's very little research going on on how to uh, uh, address that. And then, um, I will, probably may not go to this, but repurposing measurement to support disruptive innovations which would lead to these higher efficiencies is another thought. Uh, Michael Porter at Harvard is the one who's really been um, banging the drum for health outcomes achieved per dollar spent. Um, the, the, there's a paper, there's a follow-up paper describing this beautiful conceptual model um, which sort of begs a lot of other questions uh, around, well, what is an episode of care? What's the outcome? Which outcomes matter? How are they going to be measured? Uh, and I think uh, the International Consortium for Health Outcomes Measurement, which is sort of the Harvard Business School uh, uh, initiative to try to do this, has run into a lot of challenges trying to implement uh, that. And I probably won't go through the reasons that's hard. A second is this notion of reimagining quality measurement. And we did this mostly as a thought experiment. Uh, but uh, right now, guideline adherence drives what is measured and what is uh, considered adherence to or, or performance. And we postulated that actually that's not how clinical medicine works. It's that plus the patient's preferences, goals, uh, needs, desires. And the effectiveness of the clinical interventions and the goals and preferences really need to be balanced against one another. So then we said, well, is there a way one could get to that model? And then every patient actually becomes part of the denominator because every patient has a set of conditions, set of goals. And so uh, at the simplest level, we thought, if you could get a comprehensive inventory of who this person is, their clinical uh, health status, risks, and healthcare needs, that would be useful. If you had analytics that could match guideline-based interventions to, to uh, uh, evidence-based interventions to the documented patient needs, that would be helpful. That's kind of what's going on in a clinician's mind. What's really uh, not there is the structured record of the patient's health-related goals and preferences to inform how one would prioritize the interventions. Uh, but one could imagine that as the health outcome would be how well you optimize the well-being of the patient around these goals and preferences. Uh, and that aggregate estimate could be done at several levels, actually, if you could figure out how to do the math and do the computation. And also figure out the temporal trends, because patients' goals and preferences change over time. The evidence changes over time, but more slowly. And so, uh, that was the idea. Uh, in that paper, we actually did a little thought experiment with two patients who have the exact same uh, clinical uh, current care opportunities, uh, and then we walked through different preferences and said, what would the outcome, what would the, what would the actual therapy, chosen therapy, look like in that circumstance? And with the power of uh, data and the cloud, computational power, I'm not sure this is so far off. We actually uh, beginning to think that um, this, this isn't impossible to do. And actually, I was talking with David earlier about some work they're doing here along this line. But the notion of passive data collection with consent, uh, 
personal interactive digital assistants that could actually be measuring this stuff in real time. Your Alexa could be trying to figure out what your goals, preferences, and needs are if it wasn't too annoying. Uh, and then using these large data computational methods to predict uh, who's going to benefit or not. Now this is uh, obviously <laughs> space age for the future, but maybe closer than we think in terms of the, uh, at least the technical capacity to do this sort of work. Um, I wanted to throw in this about social media data. Uh, this is a paper from 2016 on sentiment analysis of tweets, uh, who people are tweeting at hospitals. And uh, they, it's a very technically complicated uh, way that they were able to sort of do the sentiment analysis on the sampled tweets um, and involved huge volumes of data. Uh, and all publicly available, they did this probably on a shoestring with just some computational work and, and, and an Amazon uh, capability that allows um, them to crowdsource the tweet uh, analysis, tweet sentiment analysis. But they did find a relationship between uh, mor pay mortality uh, and sentiment uh, among uh, hospitals that had uh, at least greater than or equal to 50 tweets. That is um, preliminary. People are mining Facebook data, um, tw Twitter data, uh, and other social media data to try to refine these methods. I think that's something we should keep an eye on in the future. You know, the time is going to run out here, so I'm going to leave the um, question about disruptive innovations for another time, if that's OK, and go straight to, um, uh, let's see. Because I do, uh, I guess the main point is that I think that the digital health innovations that are coming relatively quickly are going to make it possible to deliver care in ways that we haven't kind of yet grasped. Um, I have a whole different talk on that. Maybe I'll have to come back another time and do that one. Uh, I would love to do that. Uh, but my, uh, the principles, I think, for this pivot or reset are that we should, we really should just retire pay for performance applications of measurement. The, um, the incentives are, are the wrong incentives. Uh, the effects are not the effects that we want. And we're spending a lot of money and time and energy that could be spent in more productive ways. I do think there's a key role, though, for retaining measurement and reporting at an aggregate level for regions, large organizations, hospitals, uh, large delivery organizations, health insurers, uh, because we do need some way of monitoring what's happening to the population as we change and reform the healthcare delivery system. <clears throat> but I don't think these should be annual, like, routine reporting exercises. They should be targeted analyses that inform policymakers and regulators and managers who can help to uh, interpret the data and um, figure out how to, how to kind of make it real in terms of improvement projects. Um, I do think we're not focused enough on some of the key policy objectives. Uh, one of the things we discovered in our comparison to the other countries that do well on our performance is that um, policy objectives like improving the population's health, obesity, suicide, and all the rest, are, are kind of under-resourced at this point. Uh, access to care is still a problem, especially for people who are uninsured or underinsured. Uh, and um, we have a weakening and dying primary care system in this country, which needs a major re overhaul. We also could reduce an administrative burden. One of the challenges in our system, which I think everyone can resonate with in this room, is the amount of administrative stuff that has to be done that takes also diverts people. And then I, we, given the socioeconomic inequalities in our country, measuring and reporting on disparities of care is going to be crucial too. So in conclusion, <coughs> you know, how we, the, the telescope that Galileo had, wood and glass, has been supplanted by, uh, this is the Mars orbiter, which uh, was mapping the planet's surface. Uh, and so with a much better, more complex technology, uh, with more uh, bandwidth and more uh, frequencies to be able to observe, was able to give us a very detailed map of the surface of Mars. I think that is possible. This is a vision that we should continue to strive for. Um, it's uh, potentially an expensive vision, but there, like I say, the changes in the digital environment, uh, not just in healthcare, but more broadly, could, could support it. Um, there are innovative cost-saving care models percolating in the environment. The Commonwealth Fund actually is supporting some of those. 
and studying them and, and sharing that information if you go to our website. Um, I do think there's a diversion of resources. I think we can still use quality measurement judiciously to serve uh, specific improvement goals. And I think we're under-investing right now in R&D. Um, much of what came to us as HEDIS actually was an investment made in the 1990s by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. You can argue with that investment, but we don't even have version 2.0. At this point, CMS is developing the quality measures, and they're just trying to serve their program needs. So um, anyway, I'll stop there. It's been uh, terrific to uh, talk with you all, and I'd love to take questions if there are. Yeah, we've got time for questions. Yes. Um, so you mentioned that one of the barriers to um, measuring uh, quality of care, um, or at least the effects of measuring quality of care, is that the consumer isn't um, making choices based on that quality. But to me, it seems that the reason that patients wouldn't be making choices is because they have no choices, right? Like, especially if you're um, someone with on Medicare, you or Medicaid, you have like have one position pretty much you can yeah. go to. So it doesn't matter what the reviews are. So what? A much easier, or at least this would answer, wouldn't it help with part of the problems that we're looking to solve, the increasing quantity of physicians and then working on increasing access to care for people. So then the consumer's um, thoughts on um, how well they're being treated would be automatically accounted for in the fact that physicians who weren't treating patients well just wouldn't have patients. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. In the 1980s, late 80s, 90, early 90s, New York State started its cardiac surgery mortality reporting system. And that was a public health department initiative. And it was not publicly reported. It was, <clears throat> uh, there was a team that would go to the hospitals where there were m potential mortality problems, work through what they were doing differently. They actually would bring in people from other hospitals. It was essentially an, um, a directed sort of peer review uh, model. And it was very effective because they discovered practices going on in the high mortality hospitals that, you know, like rushing patients to the OR rather than stabilizing them before surgery that turned out to be very powerful in reducing mortality. There were a few physician outliers who were also identified as someone who should have been retired, you know, a few years ago. And so that, <coughs> that only became a public reporting system because uh, Newsday demanded it under the Freedom of Information Act and then they felt like they had to provide a consumer element to it. But you're right. In our first studies in the 1990s of, of these mortality programs, 78% uh, of people were like in the hospital for three days before they had surgery and, and didn't have a choice. Uh, that's probably changed now, and cardiac surgery has certainly changed in that time. But I think your point about d targeting the performance information to regulators, managers, public health uh, people, improvement teams that can actually affect change is going to deliver more for patients over the long run especially when they have no choice. Yeah. So there's another part to that question that's very interesting, which is just the matter of having choice. Yeah. And, and one of the things we've seen is, as the information requirements to for the federal government and human models rise, there are huge returns to being a large system. Yeah. Being a large system implies less choice. That's right. So, I mean, these... They're, inter these they're definitely very interrelated, yeah. There's a lot of consolidation in the industry uh, which, which does mean if, at every level. So it's insurance, fewer choices. Um, doctors and hospitals, fewer choices. Even ambulatory centers, you know, they're consolidating so that you may not have a choice. Physicians seem to still have a choice within those systems, yeah. I think there's also a, a major issue with what, is cap what we are capable of measuring. And I, and I like your, your um, idea that as our, as our data capabilities go up, we'll be better, but I still think that there's a lot that I'm the hospital epidemiologist here and spend a lot of my time doing these things. Um, and we're still limited by what we can measure in terms of actual human behavior and what people do. You can measure how patients feel about their experience with a physician, <coughs> but you can't measure what the doctor did that did or didn't result in that kind of an outcome. And, and, and this is not to say that certainly outcomes do help us with that to a certain degree. Yeah. But who fits into that denominator and why they fit and why they don't fit and whether or not they should fit is another issue entirely based on what data we can collect and what data we can't collect. So that results in things that we can measure being low-hanging fruit yeah. automatically. And then as soon as you start to measure those things, everyone becomes about the same as you showed in your graphics. 
Yeah. But there's not, I've not seen the same amount of movement to figuring out what's the next level of hanging fruit. Instead, we just keep looking for more low hanging fruit to, that is measurable. Yeah, it's one of the significant challenges that CMS has defined for its, for its programs that everything has to come off claims data. It's, uh, yeah, that is, a, that is a real limitation. Yeah, and as long as, as, long as you're kind of hamper, you know, that's one of the reasons I think there's not a lot of innovation is because they've sort of set that as a, as a precondition. And once that's done, you, you have a lot, there's not a lot of fruit. I mean, people actually are making heroic efforts. Uh, there's a great paper, um, Debbie Pikus and her group uh, from Mathematica, that actually came up with a way of measuring the comprehensiveness of primary care by observing diagnosis coding patterns over a period of time and looking at the relative allocation of those codes. I think that's kind of innovative. Uh, they had three different kind of measures of uh, the range of practice and, and they could actually sort of identify these primary care docs. But that's, that's, um, that takes a fair amount of imagination and technical work to sort of figure out how to make that work and then how to test it and validate it and make and sure that it's capturing something real. Yes, but the good news is it's just claims data, so they didn't have to bother any clinicians that weren't already bothered. <laughs> That's a great question. Thank you. So how do you um, get all this complex data and be able to go to the lowest common denominator, which in terms of rating, which is an Amazon review one through five or a Yelp review? Because I, I would think that there's some people, some uh, you know, consumers, healthcare and consumers that want to go through the reams of data yeah. about you know their options every October. Yeah. Then there's the people that look at the you know their pamphlet and say, oh, this health system or this health insurance is five, or that one's four, and four and a half. So I'll just go with the five. Yeah. I think that there's two, you know, maybe two different types of people, and I think the vast majority of the people are just going to be like, yep. That's, that doctor is five, or that doctor, is, or that insurance program is five. I'll just take that. Yeah. You're, you're, you're saying that you need to get all this data and synthesize it and try to accurately profile something. Yes. Quality. Yes. But most people will just be like, I'll take the five. Yeah, so um, it reminds me of the uh, Saturday Night Live skit where the census taker <laughs> comes to uh, Christopher Walken's apartment, knocks on the door and says, you know, how many people live here? And he said, Walken says, what do most people say? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a challenge. And, and actually, uh, there are methods for kind of uh, um, uh, the fact that, that most ratings are biased upwards. There are actually some methods in survey research to try to disentangle that. The other thing I think is interesting, and, and uh, maybe more to your point, is the Mark Schlesinger's group at Yale has been working on narrative analysis and narrative comments and, and extracting information from narratives, which is actually a richer source of information if you can figure out how to, how to extract the information from that context. I'm actually a little down on the rating notion, the idea of a score. Uh, I don't think that gives people a lot of guidance in terms of what needs to be improved. And so I... I, I show summary slides like that, but I don't think that should be the goal. I think the goal is always, what, what, do, we, what do we think we want to improve? What's the targeted set of data that could help us make that improvement happen? Do we have a model for what we would intervene on to, to, to help it happen? And then taking it from there. So I'm I, 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 sorry if I misstated my position there. Yeah? The, um, U.S. healthcare gets a lot of beating because it has become a political send people to Congress and get people out of it. But if you review the literature, actually, you will find out it's one of the best systems because here people are treated individually based on the individual. A lot of other European people are based on group and policy. Mm. For example, uh, I was reading that in a Scandinavian country and others, uh, they recommend no mammography for women after the age of seven. All right, so you will save a lot of money on this. You don't have to treat the people who have cancer and die, so quality is better. You do not do kidney transplant or do all this after the age of 60. 
So 65. So imagine how much you save money on this type of thing, and you are not dealing with very ill people. Right. A member of my family, uh, they sent x-rays to me from London, had a metastasis to the brain, pay to 55. Yeah. He operate here, but they told him, go on and uh, celebrate the Christmas. Maybe you will better do that. So um, the child mortality here is supposed to be the worst. But if you take the first year out, which comes from a lot of um, lack of health, addiction, premature thing, then exactly become like European system, become like Canada if you take yeah. the first. So I think uh, it is so hard to try to find out how to correct it. Because there are so many statistical issues in there. Yeah, so, so, so you as a doctor, <coughs> you are sort of saying, you know, stop to do what to do. Yeah, the, the, you're raising a really fundamental question about what's the purpose of a healthcare delivery system. Right. And is that purpose, as has been decided in the Netherlands or in the UK, the purpose is to provide a basic level of care for everyone, make sure that happens, along with social investments that make people less, you know, less likely to become sick, addicted, or other things? Uh, or is the purpose to focus all our efforts on people who are advanced illness or, uh, and I think we've made a different decision. I think you're absolutely right about that. Our policies reflect a different decision about whether we prioritize access to care uh, as opposed to highly technical, um, costly care. Um, some of us believe actually that shift, we're, we're the richest country in the world, right? We should be able to kind of work that out and I think that's one of the reasons the political debates are as heated as they are because there are different views within the country about what the right way is to do that. Actually, I don't think people disagree on the need to kind of expand access. The question is more about what's the mechanism for getting there. But I, I, uh, I you know, you, this is what makes performance measurement so interesting is that one can take so many different lenses and apply them and they can teach you different lessons about what a system is doing, what it, how it performs and, and what the needs are and how those could be modified. So I, I appreciate your, your comments and question. Oh, by the way, in any com a conference I've ever been at where people are asked, if you needed care, where would you go? Uh, most of the Europeans will say, well, I'd go to my, my country. In fact, our Harkness fellows spend a year in the US. And they always say, oh, I'd rather be in my country. They say, if you had advanced cancer of a rare type, where would you rather go? The US. I would definitely make the trip to the US for that. So right there, you've got that dynamic of if there's a trade-off, like, how sick am I? How complicated is it? Do I, can I get the best technical expertise in the world versus, wow, I don't get a bill. I walk into the doctor's office, I get seen, I get taken care of, I walk out, and I don't get a bill. I mean, Amer